The Amistad. Its name invokes memories of one of the most important moments in the history of the Atlantic slave trade. A moment when all the eyes of the world were suddenly on the small state of Connecticut as they defended the rights of the 53 Africans stolen from their homeland. They freed themselves from those who had enslaved them, but soon found themselves back in chains and at the center of an international firestorm. This is their story. In 1839, 500 African people were kidnapped and sold to slave traders in what is now Sierra Leone. In the port of Lomboco, they were boarded onto the Tacora, a Portuguese ship bound for Havana, Cuba. The voyage would last 10 weeks with up to a third dying from disease, malnutrition, or at the hands of their captors. Some of the most powerful countries in the world, like the United States and Britain, had already abolished the slave trade, but Spain had weaseled their way out of it by not abolishing the slave trade in their own colonies. They also turned a blind eye to the fact that a large number of slaves were seemingly born in Cuba overnight. You see, this is how traders got around the ban, by bringing in captives from places like Sierra Leone into Cuba and declaring them to be born there. Thus, they were legally slaves. Two Spaniards, Jose Ruiz and Pedro Montes bought 53 of the Sierra Leone captives, 49 men, one boy, and three girls, to be boarded onto the Amistad to sell at other ports. Or so they thought. The Amistad was not a slave ship and was ill-prepared for human cargo. Thus, the crew had to place half of the captives below deck and half above deck. Able to move about the ship, they could see the comings and goings of the crew the location of the weapons, the layout of the ship, and who could actually take them back home. And three days after they left Cuba, their time had come. On July 1st, 1839, the captives obtained a rusty file that proved just enough to saw through their manacles. Once freed from their chains, they armed themselves with cane knives, and from their ragtag group, a leader quickly emerged. His English name is Joseph Sinke, but his African name is Singbe. He would later become the representative during the court proceedings, but his talents were also suited in other areas. Under his command, they attacked the crew, killing most, but saving three men. The two Spaniards that bought them and knew how to navigate back to Africa, and the other man, Antonio, who was the former captain's Creole slave and was good with navigation. Singbe demanded they be returned home, but they were deceived. Ruiz and Montez sailed north, dropping anchor off the east coast of Long Island. It wasn't long before the USS Washington, a revenue cutter, spotted the Amistad and took custody of not only the ship, but everyone on board. All ships and parties involved sailed to the nearby port of New London, Connecticut. But the lieutenant of the USS Washington had other motives. He saw opportunity. He presented officials with a written claim for his property rights under international admiralty law which included the salvage of the vessel and the Africans. You see, he didn't see people trying to make their way back home. He saw profit. The lieutenant transferred the captured Africans into the custody of the United States District Court for the District of Connecticut, at which time legal proceedings began in New Haven, Connecticut. The Africans were first charged with mutiny and murder, but the court ruled that they lacked jurisdiction owing to the fact that the act took place on a Spanish ship in Spanish waters, and therefore, it became a property case. There's a lot to unpack, so let's start with the parties involved. Lieutenant Thomas Gedney filed a libel for the salvage of the vessel Amistad. This includes the African captives. Henry Green and Pelletai Fordnam also filed a libel for the same salvage, saying that they were the ones that discovered the Amistad first. Jose Ruiz and Pedro Montes filed a libel for cargo and slaves. The Office of the United States Attorney for the District of Connecticut was representing the Spanish government, and they filed a libel for the cargo, slaves, and the Amistad to be returned to Spain. Antonio Vega, Vice Consul of Spain, filed a libel for the slave Antonio, who said that he was his property. 
the merchants from Cuba, whose cargo was on the Amistad, also filed a libel. Finally, the Africans, with the help of the Amistad Committee, filed a libel stating they were not property and therefore could not be returned to the Spanish government. To make matters even more confusing, the British government got involved due to their treaty with Spain stating that the slave trade south of the equator was banned. They invoked the Treaty of Ghent, which they had signed with the United States at the end of the War of 1812 and bound them in mutual prohibition of the international slave trade. The British sent Dr. Richard Madden, who served on behalf of the British Commission to suppress African slave trade in Havana, to testify in court. He made a deposition that some 25,000 slaves were brought into Cuba every year, with the wrongful compliance of, and personal profit by, Spanish officials. Dr. Madden, who was acting on the behalf of the British government, refuted Spain's claim that the Amistad captives were born in Cuba. Meanwhile, Spain was actively pushing back against Britain and pressuring the United States as they believed that they had the strongest claim on the Africans. The Spanish were further encouraged that they would win by none other than U.S. Senator John Calhoun and the Senate's Committee of Foreign Relations. On April 15, 1840, they issued a statement announcing complete conformity between the views entertained by the Senate and the arguments argued by the Spanish minister concerning La Amistad. Fun fact, Crazy Eyes Calhoun was actually John Quincy Adams' vice president, though not by choice, which makes for a very interesting twist later on in our story. While all this was occurring, the Africans needed a strong legal defense. In response, the Amistad Committee was formed by abolitionist and merchant Louis Tappan, who also hired Roger Sherman Baldwin to defend the Africans. Professor Josiah Willard Gibbs Sr., a Yale professor, aided the cause and learned to count to ten in the African language, Mendy. With this, he wandered the docks of New York City, counting repeatedly until approached by a 20-year-old sailor and former slave, James Covey, who himself was a native Mendy speaker who was also fluent in English. Finally able to hear the African story for the first time, the Amistad Committee filed charges of false imprisonment, kidnapping, and assault against Ruiz and Montez. In response, they posted bail and fled back to Cuba, which then turned this case from a property case into a criminal case. In court, the committee told the honest truth about how the Africans had come to be in the United States. Meanwhile, President Martin Van Buren was lurking, I'm sorry, working behind the scenes to send the Africans back to Cuba. Before a decision had even been reached, he sent over a schooner to New Haven to send back the captives for fear of his relationship with Spain and his re-election prospects in the South. Unfortunately for him, the judge ruled in favor of the Africans. The rest of the cases were sorted, and the most important thing was that they were free. Justice had prevailed, and Martin Van Buren was thwarted. After all, the executive branch is separate from the judicial branch. Right? Van Buren fired back at the decision, ordering the U.S. Attorney for the District of Connecticut to immediately appeal to the U.S. Circuit Court for Connecticut District to challenge the U.S. District Court's ruling. In April 1840, the U.S. Circuit Court said, Duh! and upheld the U.S. District Court's decision. But of course, the U.S. Attorney was not satisfied and took it to the highest court in the land, the Supreme Court. Hey, History Heroes! I hope you enjoyed this episode of Time with Tempest. This is part one of the Amistad. Its conclusion, part two, will be coming out in two weeks' time. That episode will also be featuring an exclusive interview from the senior educator at Discovering Amistad. You will not want to miss that one. But in the meantime, remember to subscribe if you want to learn more hidden history, bang that bell to be notified of our hidden history, distribute your delight, and leave your calling card in the comments below because the YouTube algorithm gods demand it. And also, I want to know what you think. So let me know in the comments below. And until next time, Stay curious, history heroes.